Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ronald Coleman in Libel with Edna Best and Otto Kruger. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The American picture public has often been accused of being fickle, of raising a player to the heights of stardom one day and tossing him into obscurity the next. I don't think the charge is valid. The public is always faithful to the true artist. And as Exhibit A for that argument, I give you Mr. Ronald Coleman. On his part, Mr. Coleman never does a picture or a radio play unless he believes the story will interest the public. And I think that tonight's story is, for all practical purposes, the perfect radio play. It's Edward Wool's Broadway dramatic hit, Libel. And to do justice to both our play and star, we've gathered an unusually fine cast, headed by Otto Kruger and Edna Best. Libel is a drama of the courtroom and of the man who calls himself Sir Mark Laden. This man must go to the witness stand to try to prove his right to that name. And when he does, he sees the shadow of doubt cross even the face of his wife. You of the Lux Radio Theater audience are the spectators at this trial. Each one of you has a reserved seat, just as you always have in this national theater every Monday night, with the compliments of Lux Toilet Soap. Through the years, we've seen a whole cavalcade of dramas pass in review across this stage, acted by the finest talent Hollywood can provide. These Monday evening dramas are really a national family custom. In bringing you these plays each week, and this is the ninth season of the Lux Radio Theater, we've naturally hoped that more and more of you would give our product a fair trial. We rest our case on the evidence you have discovered for yourselves. Millions of this audience who use Lux Toilet Soap have already rendered their verdict in its favor, and the number grows from month to month and from year to year. Now for a good play, Libel, starring Ronald Coleman as Sir Mark Laden, Edna Best as Lady Enid Laden, and Otto Kruger as Foxley. <laughs> It is 1934, just 16 years after the armistice of the First World War. In the pleasant English countryside stands the home and estate of Sir Mark Laden, Member of Parliament. A wide drive bordered by trees leads to the front gate. There, hidden in the foliage, a man in rough clothes peers intently at the house. At last at the gate, and moves slowly toward the door. He rings the bell, and as he waits, he seems to smile inwardly. Good morning. Morning. I'd like to see the master, if you don't mind. I'm very sorry, sir, <coughs> but I don't believe Sir Mark was expecting anyone. Sir Mark, is it? Ha. Well, you go and tell Sir Mark that Pat Buckingham is here. He'll see me. We serve together in the army. Sir Mark and I. Ha. Go on, tell him. Mm, very well, sir. If you'll wait in the library, I'll speak to Sir Mark. Good morning. Well, hello. Did you wish to see me about something? No, 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 sir. Don't tell me you don't remember me. I'd hardly believe that, sir. I'm very sorry. Your face is familiar, Just but... think a little, sir. The German prison camp at Obheim, 1918. Obheim? Of course. Oh, you were one of the men I escaped with. That's right. There were three of us. Sir Mark Lodden, Frank Welney, and Pat Buckingham. Pat Buckingham. Yes, I remember now. Sit down, Pat. It's good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. My memory isn't what it used to be. How have you been, Pat? Oh, pretty well. Has the world been treating you all right? Well, frankly, no. Those things are beginning to look up a bit. But the fact is, I could stand the loan of a few thousand pounds. A few... Thousand. That's right. 
I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd just drop by and see if you could help me out. You seem to be well, fairly well off. <laughs> yes, I am, but... So it won't be much of a loss to you, eh, Frank? Frank? Yes, Frank. Frank Wilney. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand this. Why do you call me Frank Wilney? Because it used to be your name. What do you want to be called loud? Lord Algy? Do you pretend you don't remember my name was Mark? Na 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 na, none of your blarney, Frank. I don't want to be nasty after all this time. You looked enough like poor old Mark to be his twin. I always said that. I remember joking about it the night we escaped. I said if Sir Mark got killed, Frank Wellney could always go back to England in his place. As it turned out, Sir Mark was killed. And here you are, eh, Frank? Are you mad? I am Sir Mark Ludden. Are you now? And I say you're Frank Wellney. I say you came home under his name, took his estate, and married the girl who waited for him. Get out of here. Get out. No, 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 Frank. For a few thousand pounds, say four or five, I'd be glad to get out. But under the circumstances... Get out, I tell you. You're making a mistake, Frank. You see, there's a newspaper in London that might be very glad to know what really happened to Sir Mark. They'd pay me big for the story, even if you won't, for keeping quiet about it. Did you hear what I said? Get out of this house! All right, but it don't end here. Remember that, Frank Wilney? Political imposture. The legislator recently returned to the House of Commons as Sir Mark Lawton Baronet. Is not a baronet, not even a Lawton. Mark, what is this? I'll read it, Enid. It's all there in the paper. It explains itself. But it says you're not Mark Lawton. It... Well, go on. Read it. The man who is now posing as Sir Mark secured his position in Parliament by practicing on the voters the same deliberate fraud that he... that he practiced on his wife. Oh, Mark, this is mad. It, it must be a joke. Yes, that's what I thought at first. But it seems it's not. Well, what are you going to do about it? I intend to sue the Gazette for malicious libel. Sue them? What else can I do? I put the matter in the hands of Sir Wilfred. He's going to represent me. You're going to court? You're going to let them drag your name through a filthy mess of lies that... Oh, Mark, you can't. Enid, listen. If I could ignore this story, believe me, I would. The last thing in the world I want to do is to risk my career, risk my life, our life together, on anything so stupid. But they won't let me ignore it, Enid. You speak of a risk. Well, what risk can there be? There are hundreds of people right here in our own village who can swear that you are Mark Larden. Yes, that's true. Well, then. Sir Wilfred has advised me to go through with the case. In my name. The Gazette is going to contend that... that I look like Sir Mark Larden. That I came home after the war and took his name and his place here. But that I am really someone else. Oh, Mark, this is horrible. How can they say such a thing? Oh, they were probably glad to get the story. They've been against me politically ever since I took office. Oh, but they must realize what it'll mean to them if you bring suit. You can ruin them. If we win, of course. If you win? Well, what doubt is there? They've printed a malicious, horrible lie. As plaintiff, we'll have to prove it a lie. I think we can. Think? Oh, Mark, I don't understand you. Enid, it's not as easy as it sounds. Not easy to prove that you are yourself. They're going to say that I am not myself. That I look enough like Mark Ludden to fool anyone. To fool even you. To fool me? Enid, look at me. Look at me, darling. It's going to be very difficult these next few weeks. I'll need all your strength and all your courage. Oh, Mark, you frighten me. You are Mark Ludden. I know that. You're my husband, the father of my child. You are. Enid, of course I am. Well, then why are you so worried? You were a boy in this village. You lived in this house. You were born in the East Room upstairs. There are things about this house, about the people who've lived here, that only Mark Lawton would know. You can tell them. They'll have to believe you then. Enid. Well, they'll have to, Mark. Darling, there's something I must tell you. You'll know sooner or later. You'll know in court. I want to tell you now. What is it? Do you remember when I came home after the armistice? I... I had changed, hadn't I? Well, you'd been shell shocked <coughs> Yes, but no one knew how much I had changed, only myself. Enid, I had to piece my life together again. In that prison camp at Hobheim, I knew my name only from my identification list. Mark. 
I knew you only by the letters you wrote that were forwarded to me there. You say I can prove who I am by telling them things that happened here when I was a boy. I can't, Enid. I have no recollection of anything. I remember nothing that happened to me, nothing, before I was a prisoner in that camp. Enid. Enid, why do you look at me like that? Enid. You are Mark Lawton. You are the boy I knew. You must be. You must be. Enid. You may proceed with the case for the plaintiff, Sir Wilfred. Thank you, my lord. Members of the jury, I'm not going to insult you by any further explanation of the libelous charges recently appearing in the Daily Gazette. You've seen for yourself that the Daily Gazette has informed a million or so readers that my client, Sir Mark Lawton, is an infamous impostor in every possible role of life, public and domestic. The first witness for the plaintiff will be the plaintiff himself, Sir Mark Lawton. You swear by Almighty God? I swear by Almighty God. The evidence you shall give? The evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth? Shall be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, you are <laughs> Sir Mark Lawton, third baronet of Ingworth Hall in the county of Norfolk? That is so. You retired with the rank of major after 15 years' service in the rifle brigade? That's right. I believe you became engaged in 1914 to Enid, the only daughter of General Edgar Winterton, C.B., we were engaged just before the war. And after your engagement, I believe you went to France with your battalion in August 1914. Yes. Then you were wounded and taken prisoner at the Battle of the Marne. I was. What wounds did you sustain at that battle, Sir Mark? I was shot through both legs and badly shell-shocked. I believe the farm in which you lay wounded was set on fire by the enemy's guns, and you were nearly burnt to death before you were rescued by the enemy. Uh, very nearly. Hmm. What effect did that terrible experience have on you? Those few hours that afternoon, it turned my hair gray, as you see it now. What was it at that moment? Oh, I hadn't a gray hair. I was only 22. What happened after you were taken prisoner? I was in a German hospital for three months, and then sent to an officer's prison camp at Hubheim. When were you released? Oh, I was never released. I escaped. In October 1918, I reached the Belgian frontier... Three days before the armistice. And then? Then I made my way fairly easily to the English lines and was invalided home. What did you do then? I retired from the army and had a long rest cure. After six months or so, I was as well as I suppose I ever shall be and married my wife. Yeah, I think your son Gerald was born the following year. Yes, that is so. You have recently entered public life and were last autumn elected member of parliament for the Raynham Division of Norfolk. Yes. What is the present state of your health? Subject to a bit of a limp, I can indulge in any reasonable physical effort. What about mental effort? Oh, I suppose I mustn't say too much about that. Apart from memory, I don't complain. Ah, yes. Sir. What of your memory? I have practically no recollection at all of events or persons before my imprisonment. Now, I want to turn for the moment to the libel which is the subject of this action. Yes? The jury has heard the allegations of which you complain, Sir Mark. Is there a word of truth in them? They are an infamous lie. Has anyone else any right to your title, estate, or position? Not a soul in the world. Has any member of your family at any time displayed any difficulty in identifying you? No, not one. Until this paragraph appeared in the Gazette. Ah. Well, I think I've only... One more question to put to you, Sir Mark. How did you first learn of this libelous publication? It was sent to me by friends and constituents, but I first read it in my own copy of the paper. I happen to be a registered reader of the Gazette. I don't agree with its views, but oh, I've always liked all sorts of fiction. Thank you, Sir Mark. That will be all. Does counsel for the defense <laughs> wish to examine the witness? We do, my lord. So, you have always liked all sorts of fiction, have you? Yes, I said so. You've indulged that liking to a rather abnormal extent, haven't you? What do you mean? 
I'm suggesting that ever since November 1918, you have indulged in the unscrupulous fiction of being an English baronet. That is an infamous libel for which your clients will have to pay. Of being the lawful owner of the Loddon Estates? I am the lawful owner. Keep calm, Samak. And the most unscrupulous fiction of all, of being entitled to woo and marry your wife. My wife doesn't require the protection of the gutter press. And on my instructions, I'm not so sure of that. Now, uh, before we go any further, I want to be quite clear. Uh, you don't wish to suggest to the jury that any physical or mental disability, uh, prison or escape experiences, could possibly make you believe you were someone other than yourself? Hmm? Do you suggest such a thing? No, I don't. You've sustained no injury that could make Frank Welney honestly believe he was... Sir Mark Lawton? Of course not. Whom did you say, Mr. Foxley? Frank Welney, my lord. Who is Frank Welney? Uh, if your lordship would allow me to explore that in my own way. Certainly, Mr. Fox. Thank you, my lord. I'm sure the uh, witness has heard of a man called Frank Welney. Certainly. He was a Canadian officer? I believe so. Did you ever know him? Yes. I was at the same prison camp in Germany. So I believe. And for how long? <laughs> Nearly four years. Hmm. When did you last see him? Uh, let me see. It would be... Uh, let me help you. Did you shave yourself this morning? Yes. Why? Uh, didn't you see him then? Hmm? When you looked in the mirror? You mean that I... Oh, I am suggesting that you are Frank Welney and that he is you. That's a lie. That is it. We shall see. Now, uh, when did you say you saw him last? When we escaped together in November 1918. We got parted got parted? Why did you get parted? We, we missed each other in the dark. Oh, you missed each other in the dark. Uh, is that really all you can tell me of how you separated? Absolutely all. Hmm. It's very easy to get lost in the dark. The other fellows had got hold of civilian clothes, but I hadn't. I was in uniform, so we had to move by night. Uh, was anyone else in the party of escape? Yes, a man called Buckingham. And that was the party. Sir Mark Lawton, Buckingham, and Welney. Yes, myself and the other two. How did you separate? I told you. We got... We lost each other in the dark. Yes, and which of you got lost first? Buckingham went off first to forage for food. He didn't come back. Oh, that left Larden and Welney together. Then what happened? Then Welney went off to look for Buckingham. He never came back either. Uh, both got lost the same fatal night. Or killed. Ah, killed. That was it, was it? I don't know. I only mean Welney. I know Buckingham is alive, and so do you. Uh, well, now, who do you say was killed? Welney or Larkin? I won't answer that question. You know I'm alive. <laughs> yes. yes, I know you're alive. Uh, did you make any inquiries at the time about your, shall we say, mislaid companions? Of course I did. And uh, you've never heard from either of them since? Not from Welney. Yeah. Uh, do you think they're dead or alive? I know Buckingham is alive. And what of Welney? Well, I've no doubt he's dead. Oh, well, don't be so unduly pessimistic. Uh, would you please describe Frank Welney's appearance to the jury? Nothing peculiar, very ordinary-looking fellow. Oh, come, come, come. No, I don't want you to be so modest. Uh, wasn't he, in fact, remarkably like you? No. No. Well, I'll put the question in another way. Wasn't he remarkably like Sir Mark Lawton? I never noticed it. You never noticed it? Never. Did other people notice it? Hmm? Did they? Yes. Who noticed it? Buckingham. He pretended to think that we were very much alike. He pretended? Hmm. I, I wonder if you remember any physical peculiarities about this man well named. No, I can't say I do. No? Then I shall try to help you. Thank you. I'm lucky enough to have an official description of Welney from the Canadian Army records. Most fortunate. Ah, let's see if this helps us at all. Uh, height, five foot ten. That's about your height, isn't it? And a good many millions besides? I dare say. Uh, blue eyes. And what color are yours? You can see for yourself. Yes, and so can the jury. They're, they're blue, gentlemen. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, thick crop of gray hair. How would you describe yours? How would you describe yours if you'd been through what I went through? Mm. Now, uh, even a more important physical feature of Frank Welney. It seems uh, from this record that he had lost the two first joints of the first finger of his right hand. Had he? Yes, he had. How'd you lose yours? My finger, do you mean? Yes. By a curious coincidence, you've also lost the first finger of your right hand. I don't know about 
coincidence. I'm not ashamed of my wounds. Well, how did you lose it? My finger was shot off by, by a chance German bullet when I was escaping. Oh, when you were escaping. Uh-huh. And uh, that would produce the interesting result that uh, no one who was at the prison camp with you could remember that Sir Mark Lawton had lost a finger. Huh? Of course not. But I remember, Mr. Foxy. Yeah, okay. Uh, would you mind holding your right hand up to the jury so that they remember, too? Oh, thank you. Now, I'm uh, going to read one more thing from this official record of the unfortunate Frank Wellney. He has the initials FW tattooed on his right forearm in a red and blue circle. Have you? Now I come to think of it, I remember he was tattooed. I wonder if you would mind showing my lord and the jury your forearm. What is your suggestion? No, I'm glad to make it clear. I definitely suggest your right forearm has the letters F.W. tattooed on it. I don't want to conceal anything. I'm quite prepared to admit my arm is tattooed and has some letters on it, but not those. Well, may we see for ourselves what they are? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, would you show your arm to my lord and the jury? As far as I can see, the initials tattooed on the plaintiff's arm are E.W. in a red and blue circle. That is so, my lord, that I suggest those letters E.W. were originally F.W. for Frank Wellney. It would only require the addition of a single stroke, would it not? Very true. Perhaps the witness can explain the letters. Now, uh, what about the E? If you must have it, E is my wife's initial. Her name is E. Indeed. Uh, but if the letter was originally F, that explanation would not do. No, no. But as it never was, there is no difficulty. Uh, and uh, what is the W for? The W stands for her maiden name, Winter. And uh, when did you have them tattooed? In her time camp, a fellow prisoner. Why? To pass the time. Time goes rather slowly in a prison camp. Yes, I dare say. Mm-hmm. Uh, did they permit you to write letters? Yes, they did. Can you produce any letters written by Sir Mark Lawton while he was a prisoner? No, no, I can't. Fortunately, I can. I have here some specimens of Sir Mark's pre-war and prison handwriting and your post-war handwriting. Have you look at them? Well? No. Yeah. Rather different, aren't they? Shoot off your first finger and see if your handwriting is the same. Ah, did you shoot off yours? No, I did not. No, 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 no. that was a chance for it, of course. Well... It all comes down to this now, doesn't it? Frank Wellney had lost the first finger of his right hand, and you have lost yours. Frank Wellney had the letters F.W. tattooed on his right forearm (laughs) before captivity. And so Mark Lawton, the English veteran, had E.W., not almost the same letters, tattooed on the same arm during his captivity. (laughs) World of coincidence, isn't it? Yes, it seems to be. Yes, doesn't it? All of the physical features which were Wellney's are also yours. Now, can you produce one physical characteristic which would identify you as Mark Lawton? No. Uh, not even a mark or a scar from your boyhood. I told the court I don't remember my boyhood. Oh, no, no, you were shell-shocked. That's a very convenient explanation. Eh? It also happens to be the truth. I didn't want to lose all the memories of my youth. Here I am, a man of 40, over 40, and for all practical purposes, my life began 15 years ago. In a very nice life it was, too, Mr. Wellney. I am Sir Mark Ludden. That is the question we are headed to decide. If I am not Mark Ludden, what became of him? Shall I tell you? Mark Ludden is dead. Mark Ludden was murdered by Frank Wellney. And you are Frank Wellney. <laughs> In just a few minutes, Ronald Coleman, Otto Kruger, and Edna Best will bring us Act Two of Libel. And now, it's romance. A young man, a young girl, her face upturned to his. You're so lovely, Jim. Her skin, it's like satin. How about a kid stop? A scene from a movie? Oh, no, it happens every day in real life. Romantic moments when admiring eyes come close. Important moments for any woman, wouldn't you say, Libby? Yes, indeed, Mr. Kennedy. Those are the moments when a woman is glad her skin is soft and lovely. Because lovely skin certainly has irresistible appeal. 
It's too bad so many women forget that sometimes and grow careless. And that puts a damper on romance, Libby. Yes, I'm afraid it does. And you can't blame a man for not making pretty speeches if a girl lets her skin get dull and unattractive. Now, isn't that a situation where Lux Toilet Soap can help? Indeed it can, Mr. Kennedy. If a girl will give her skin regular Hollywood care for 30 days, why, she's mighty apt to hear compliments coming her way. It's worth a lot to a woman to hear remarks like this. Gosh, she's a honey. What a complexion. Now, here's what screen stars do for their precious complexions. During the day, and always at bedtime, they take active lather facials with Lux Toilet Soap. They smooth an abundance of the creamy lather well in, splash on lots of warm water to rinse, and finish with a dash of cold. Lux Soap is very gentle, so it agrees with delicate skin. It's made of the best ingredients, Libby, and it's hard milled, as only the finest toilet soaps are. Screen stars are devoted to Lux Soap. It's such a wonderful help in keeping their skin fresh and smooth for the close-up tests they have to face constantly. And for the close-up tests all women, even screen stars, have to face in real life. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. So it's a fine idea for any woman to treat her complexion right. Now, here's a tip to women who think their complexions might be lovelier. Make this 30-day test. Use Lux Toilet Soap daily, the way famous screen stars do. You'll find your skin beginning to look softer smoother, the way you want it to be. Get some pure white Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Starring Ronald Coleman as Sir Mark Lawton, Edna Best as Lady Enid Lawton, and Otto Kruger as Foxley. It's the second day of the trial. An hour before court is to reopen, the man known as Sir Mark Lawton confers with his counsel. Sir Mark's face is white and drawn, his eyes bright and feverish. Restlessly, he paces the library as he speaks. Not for myself that I mind. It's for Enid. I watched her yesterday in court. She was so bewildered, so desperately hurt. If only there was some way of sparing her. Oh, we have to bring the suit, Mark, if it's the only thing to do. I realize that. You've said it 20 times. Mark. I'm sorry, Sir Wilfred. My nerves are all on edge. Did you sleep last night? How could I sleep? I went over every word of the trial hour by hour. You should have tried to rest. We've a hard day ahead of us. Could it possibly be any harder than yesterday? What will they do? Uh, put Buckingham on the stand first, I imagine. After that, I don't know. <laughs> Buckingham, there's a witness for you. Well, I think I can take care of Buckingham. Why didn't you tell me about those tattoo marks, the letters E.W. on your arm? Why didn't you tell me? <coughs> well, I didn't think it was important. Yet you knew that Wellney had almost the same letters. The inference that F could be changed to E was something I should have been prepared for. And I didn't tell you. Am I supposed to remember every minor detail of something that happened 16 years ago? Well, that minor detail, as you call it, may prove very damaging. If I'm to represent you, Mark, you must not withhold anything that may have a bearing on the case. Withhold? Why should I withhold anything from you? I... I don't know, Mark. Well, you're beginning to talk like Foxley. Don't you believe me either? Well, I'm only trying to look at this through the eyes of the jury. That's my job, Mark. And in the eyes of the jury, I am an imposter and a murderer. Is that what you mean? I mean that minor details can sometimes blind the jury to the truth. Now, we must be very careful, Mark. Very careful. Oh, Amy, come in, dear. I didn't want to disturb you, but we haven't much time. Enid, do you think it's wise for you to come to court? I must be there, Mark. But it's horrible for you, listening to all that. Yes, it is horrible. That's why I can't stay away. I must be near you. You're my husband. Yes. Darling, you... You say it as Oh, if... please, Mark, not now. But there isn't much time to talk. No. All right, darling. <laughs> Now, Mr. Buckingham, let's get down to October in 1918. What happened then? Well, our guards were reduced, so we tried to escape. Who are we? 
Loden, Wilney and I. We got off all right and trekked towards the Belgian frontier, moving at night. Go on. A few days before the armistice, we reached the outskirts of a small town, Stavolo, just over the frontier by Malmedy. Happened then? Well, it was my turn to forage for food. I went off and left the other two in a wood, about a half a mile up the hill outside the town. When I got back, Wellney had done a bunk. Done a bunk? Yeah, he disappeared. Only Loden was there, and he was... Yeah, well, what had happened? Oh, I don't suppose we'll ever know the exact truth. Uh, Would you tell the jury what you saw? I saw poor old Mark Loden where I'd left them both. He was lying on the ground with his head bashed in. Any signs of a struggle? Rather. Loden's clothes were more red than khaki. His arm had been smashed to a pulp. Which arm? His right arm. He was smothered in blood, face and arms. And you say there was no trace of Wellney? Not a sign. And what did you do? I saw poor old Mark was dead, but I couldn't leave him there. So I lifted him as well as I could and took him along to the door of the first big house. Left him on the step and ran away. But you're sure that Sir Mark was dead? As dead as mutton. Thank you, Mr. Buckman. Your witness, Sir Wilfred. Mr. Buckham, am I right in assuming that your suggestion is that Frank Wellney murdered Sir Mark Loden? Of course he did. I left them together. What time was that? Oh, about eight or nine o'clock. Was it dark? It was dark. I've told you so. Then how can you be so sure it was poor old Mark and not Wellney that you carried? His face was smothered in blood. No doubt about it. If I hadn't known his shape when I carried him, I'd have known his uniform. He was the only one of the party in uniform. I see. Now, tell me, Mr. Buckingham, it's some years now since you were demobilized. It is. And where have you lived during those years? Ah, different places. Mm, I wonder if I can guess some of them. Did you spend nine months in Liverpool jail? Yes, I did. What for? Is that important? Very important. Well, it was a misunderstanding, that's all. Really? Then did you spend 18 months at Newcastle? Yes. In prison again. What was that for? Oh, some sort of thing. Wasn't it for blackmail? Something of the sort. Blackmail. Then did you get three years at the Old Bailey? Yes. Another misunderstanding? Yes, it was. Blackmail again. Some people might describe you as a professional blackmailer. And some people would be wrong. Now, then let the jury decide that. Your witness, Mr. Foxley. Uh, You have served several terms of imprisonment. Yes. For fraud and blackmail. Yes, I can't deny it. Have you ever been charged with murder? No. Or attempted murder? No. Of what do you accuse the plaintiff? Of murdering Mark Loden and slipping into his shoes. That's all. Witness is excused. And uh, now, my lord, I should like to ask for a short recess. Recess at this time? If it please, your lordship, it is most necessary. I would not ask it. The most important witness in this case will arrive here within the hour. He must be a very important witness, Mr. Foxley. You've had time to prepare this case. Why wasn't the witness summoned in time? He was, my lord, but it took some time to prepare for the journey. This witness is coming from the village of Stavelo on the Belgian frontier. Sir Wilfred, what is this? What are they going to do? I don't know. You'd better leave the court, Mark. Go to that little restaurant around the corner. I'll try to meet you there in ten minutes. Another cup of tea, sir? No, 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 thank you, no. Oh, nothing wrong with it, is there, sir? No, no, it's just... I I don't want any more, please. Very well, sir. Mark. Sir Wilfred, I thought you'd never come. Sit down. Well? Well, I found out who it is. The witness? Who? It's a man named Flaudon, a doctor. A doctor? Listen, Mark. That body the Buckingham left at the door in Stavlo... Yes? Dr. Flaudon discovered it that night. Yes, go on. He took it into the hospital, and whoever it was, Mark... That man is still alive. What? Alive. No, no, he can't be. Mark, he's dead, I tell you. That man is dead. He must be dead. Mark, what are you saying? What What do you know about this man? I... I I know nothing. Nothing. Pull yourself together, Mark. Yes, of course. Yes, I... I'm all right now. You say, Dr. Flaudon, that uh, you practice as a doctor of medicine in the town of Stavelo on the old Belgian frontier. Yes, monsieur. For more than 20 years, that is so. Uh, you were there in 1918? I was. Do you remember something that happened two days before the armistice? It comes back to me distinctly. 
A boy summoned me at midnight to a farmhouse near the town. There on the doorstep lay a man in a very old English uniform. I knelt down. I felt the pulse, the heart. The man was not quite dead. But so nearly a corpse has made no difference. What did you do? There was no hope of recovery. But I determined to do my best. I dressed his wounds at the farm and next morning had him removed to my hospital for mental cases. And then? Gradually, a miracle occurred. Sometimes it so happens. One life is cut short and another is spared. Sometimes a life that means nothing less than nothing uh, and... Let's get on, please. What happened as a result of your treatment? As I have told you, it was a miracle. My poor unfortunate recovered completely in a uh, physical sense. But the appalling concussion of the blows which so nearly killed him has deprived him of all intelligence. Deprived him of intelligence? Uh, what do you mean? Can he speak? I cannot say. He has a tongue, but he has not ever used it. He cannot understand a word written or spoken, English or French. He cannot think. Really? But how can you say that? Because I, Emile Flordon, have studied these things and know he's a living lug, no more. And he has been an inmate in your mental hospital ever since the night you found him? Yes. We call him number 15. Number 15? Why? What other name could we give him? We knew him not. And that has been the number of his cell ever since. I believe you can produce one or two exhibits associated with this sad case. Yes. This is the khaki jacket number 15 was wearing at the time. See how it is stained with torrents of blood. It has lost the right sleeve. It is unfortunate. I had to cut that off to examine the arm. It could not be helped. My lord, members of the jury, please notice that this jacket is the type worn by officers of the Rifle Brigade. Sir Mark Lauden was a captain in the Rifle Brigade. Now, doctor, can you produce anything else? Yes. I have brought with me another exhibit from Belgium. Number 15 himself. Number 15? Yes, my lord. That so unfortunate body without a brain. Uh... May my assistant bring him in? He is, of course, in a wheelchair. Oh, I'm sure my lord will allow it. Let him come in. Bring in number 15. Oh. 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 Let me out! Let me out! This, my lord, is number 15. Take the ladies from the court! You will notice, my lord, that the features are unrecognizable. Bring him closer, please. Thank you. You will also notice that he breathes with great difficulty. The bone structure of the head was uh, badly smashed. Some heavy instrument? Very heavy. Possibly the butt of an army rifle. I see. Now, Dr. Flaudon, uh, there's a very important question in this case. Uh, yes, monsieur? It is whether this poor man's real name is Welney or whether his real name is Sir Mark Lauder. This is indeed an interesting question, and poor number 15... He does not know, he cannot tell. It would obviously be useless to question him. Useless indeed, monsieur. Well, nevertheless, with my lord's permission, I should like to establish that this, this man is incapable of knowing who he is. You have my permission. You may question him. Number 15. Do you hear me? Number 15. Do you know your name? It is no use, monsieur. Please, please, please. Number 15. Look at me. Here, uh, turn his head this way. Now look at me. Try to think. Try to remember. Have you ever heard of a man called Sir Mark Lauder? Stop it. Stop it. Let him alone. Let him alone. Mark, be quiet. Don't you see what they've done? They've brought a dead man here. I can't stand it. I can't look at him. But you can't bear to see the result of your he's, handiwork. He's not alive. Look at his face. Yes, look at it. Mark, He's don't... a corpse. He's been dead for 15 years. Take him back to his grave. Let him rest. Let him... My lord, a recess, please. Sir Mark has fainted. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Ronald Coleman, Otto Kruger, and Edna Best will return in Act Three of Libel. Why, it's Sally. Sally, what's new with you? Well, Mr. Kennedy, I spent the afternoon at my sister's. 
This is her day for Red Cross work, so I offered to give her small baby a bath. Quite an offer, Sally. Was it well received? Well, not at first. At least not by the baby. Wanted his mama butt immediately. Oh, my, how he yelled. They they wave their arms, too, don't they? Oh, definitely. But I held him by the best baby hold methods. And then I spied a brand new cake of Lux toilet soap in the soap rack. And I had an inspiration. I put that satiny smooth cake right in his hand. He clutched it. He became interested. So cool and smooth, he seemed to think. Well, from then on, Mr. Kennedy, everything was lovey-dovey between us. I guess I'm not so bad as a baby bather. You know, Sally, that makes me think. Lux toilet soap has a wonderful effect on bathers of all ages. They can be tired and cross. But give them a cake of nice white Lux toilet soap and a tub of warm water, and they seem to perk right up. Yes. Sometimes they can even be heard singing in the bathtub. Well, Sally... The creamy, luxurious lather Lux Toilet Soap gives is an inspiration to any bathroom baritone. Even in hard water, Lux Soap lathers instantly. And here's a tip for wise buying, too. Lux Toilet Soap is hard milled. That ensures a firm, satiny smooth cake. One that can be used down to the last thin sliver. So it's an economy as well as a pleasure to use this gentle soap as a bath soap, too. It's a little luxury we can all treat ourselves to these trying days. Why not get some of this fine, inexpensive white soap tomorrow? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. After the play, Ronald Coleman will tell you about an activity that is very close to his heart. But now, here's the third act of Libel, starring Ronald Coleman, Edna Best, and Otto Kruger. third day of the trial. With the evidence mounting against the man called Laden, Sir Wilfred, in desperation, put Lady Laden on the stand. But her testimony lacked conviction. And now the opposing counsel is cross-examining. And your husband was married to you as Sir Mark Laden? Yes. Now, only a few more questions from me, Lady Laden. Did Mark Laden ever write to you from captivity? At regular intervals... After the first two months. Mm -hmm. I want you to search your memory most carefully. Did any of those letters reveal to you any loss of pre-war memories? I... No. He said nothing of it. He asked me to wait for him. You did? Yes. I waited. Mm. Uh, Did he ever complain uh, in those letters of shell shock? He never complained of anything. Uh, one, One final question, Lady Lawton. Do you now believe your husband, the plaintiff in this action, is really Mark Laden? Well, is he or is he not Sir Mark Laden? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Well, Sir Wilfred, have you decided to adopt any particular course? Is this case to go to the jury? Well, our position, my lord, is very difficult, but I fear I must yield to my client's insistent desire that I should exercise the right your lordship reserved to me of recalling the plaintiff on the question of the uniform jacket which was produced by Dr. Flaudon yesterday. I believe I did reserve that. Your client has the right to give his evidence on that one point. Thank you, my lord. Uh, Sir Mark. Uh, Will you go into the uh, witness box, please? He seems to be under great strain. He can, if he likes, give his evidence sitting down. Thank you, my lord. Sir Mark, you had an opportunity yesterday of seeing the uniform jacket produced by Dr. Flaudon. Yes. You admit it's a rifle brigade jacket. Most certainly. I have no doubt that jacket was mine. Silence! Silence! You identify the jacket as yours? Uh, yes, my lord. Do you mean your uniform was on number 15 when he was found by Dr. Flaudon? I do. I should very much like to know why. Oh, uh, we are coming to that, my lord. Uh, will you tell the court, Sir Mark, how your jacket came to be on number 15? Well, you see, Buckingham was speaking the truth when he said he went foraging that night, leaving Wellney and me together. He was away a very long time. 
we thought he'd been caught. So Welney went to look for him. When neither Welney nor Buckingham came back, I began to creep along the edge of the wood towards the town. Suddenly, round a corner, I bumped into a German soldier. He was as frightened as I was. Without a word, he fired off his rifle before he put it to his shoulder. The bullet hit my hand, and that's, uh, that's when I lost my finger. Well, what happened then? I dashed in and wrenched the rifle out of the man's hands. He put up his arm to save himself, and I, I brought the butt down on his head. He dropped like a stone. It, it was horrible. Go on. Then I, I suddenly realized where I stood. I'd lost my two companions. I felt sure they'd been caught. And on top of that, I'd killed a German soldier. That meant certain death if they found me. The only chance of getting through was to get out of my uniform and get into a German one. So I changed with the man I, I thought I'd killed. Of course, I took everything out of my own pockets. If I hadn't made the change, I'd never have got through. Never. Uh, uh, anything else you wish to add, Samar? Only this. Unless someone changed the uniform again after I got away, that poor devil whom Dr. Flaudon saved is not an Englishman at all. He is that German soldier. Well, that will be all, Samar. Mr. Foxley. Thank you. Uh, tell me, uh, 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 witness, are you sure that you're fit for cross-examination? Whatever view the jury may take, there's no doubt you've had a great shock. Yes, I've had a great shock. Yet, in some ways, I feel fitter to answer your questions than I was two days ago. Well, now, what does that mean? That shock seems to have brought a few things back to me. I believe I might be able to tell you a bit more now of pre-war events than I could then. That's very interesting. Uh, when you first gave evidence, did I hear you take the oath? Of course. To tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes. And why didn't you tell the whole truth then? I thought I did. You thought you did? <laughs> why didn't we hear a word of this encounter with a German soldier? I didn't think it mattered. Didn't think it mattered? If it was true, I suppose it... Can't you see it was only yesterday that I knew that that poor devil was still alive? Whether I'm Frank Welney or not had nothing to do with that German soldier until you produced that jacket. Uh, when did you first tell this story to anyone? This morning, to Sir Wilfred. Hmm. Did you never tell your wife? No. And why not? I didn't want her to associate me with that sort of thing. What sort of thing? I have told you, the, the, the way I killed him. I have a note of what you said. I brought the butt down on his head. He dropped like a stone. Yes, yes. Well, is that all the truth? Have we got it all even now? No. Not all. Not all. I, I'll tell you. He gave a dreadful scream and, and fell down, helpless. I had to finish him off. I had to. If I was to have a chance of getting away, getting home, seeing... Taking your time, Samar. How many more blows? How can I tell? I... I've tried to forget it all these years. I can't think of it even now. Mm. So we seem to be right. You are a man capable of brutal murder. Did you ever serve in the war, Mr. Foxley? Learned counsel do not expose themselves to questions when they are cross-examining. I don't want his answer. If he can't see the difference between murdering a fellow captive and killing an enemy soldier who's fired on you... No, no, let's, let's not get off the subject, please. Uh... Can you produce a shred of evidence that would substantiate this story? No. No, it depends on my word. With nothing to support it. And uh, what became of the German uniform you say you escaped in? I burnt it. I wanted to forget. Oh, that seems unfortunate. It might have given the name or regimental number of your mythical German. I can give you the poor devil's name and regimental number. Uh, never mind the number. Perhaps I can tell you the name. Wasn't it Mark Ludden? No, it was not. My lord, it doesn't appear to interest my learned friend, but I'm sure it will interest the jury. Samar, I want you to tell the court the name of that German soldier. It was Karl Geist. Karl Geist? Are you certain of that name? Yes, my lord. Oh. Here it is on his identity disk. Let me see it. Here, my lord. You swear this was on the body of the German soldier whose uniform you exchanged for your own that night at Stavelot? I do. And you've kept it all these years? Yes. Has anyone beside yourself ever known of the retention? No, my lord. 
No, I, I've kept it locked up. It seems to me it becomes increasingly difficult for a jury to give a verdict in this case. I only want the verdict of the jury for the sake of one person, and that's my son. I've already lost the only verdict I wanted for myself. Oh, no. No, Mark, I believe you. I do. I believe you, Mark. Silence. Silence. Has the witness anything more to say? Uh, my lord. Yes? Something... Something has just come back to me. And what is it? May I just look at my jacket? Certainly. Pass the jacket to the plaintiff. Will, well, some, will someone lend me a knife? A knife? What for? I want to cut something I sewed in the back of my breast pocket. Something sewed in? Two fifty-mark notes. And... I don't know that we can let you mutilate an exhibit. Oh, my lord, I... I've admitted it's my jacket, and, and you can see where I sewed it up. Where you sewed it? You sewed something in the lining? Yes, my lord. When did you do that? When I was at Hobheim. If I might have a knife to, to cut these stitches... You may. Uh, who has um, a, a pocket knife? Hear me now. Give it to the witness. Thank you. Before I started to escape from Hobheim with Welney and Buckingham, I wasn't too sure of my companions or what might happen to things in my pockets. I don't seem to have been far wrong. So... I sewed inside the lining of this breast pocket a photograph and two 50-mark notes. If this is my jacket, they should be here now. Well, cut it. Cut the lining. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Well? Here are the notes. And here is the photograph. <laughs> May I see the photograph, Sir Mark? Oh, it was taken many years ago, but I suppose you can recognize it. It all begins to come back to me, my lord. This is the first photograph my wife gave me when we were engaged. I took it with me to France. I always had it in that pocket. I see something is written on it. To darling... Uh, need that be read aloud, my lord? I think it should. Members of the jury, on this photograph, these words are written. To darling Mark, with all my love, Enid. With all my love. Mark. My lord. Yes, Mr. Foxley? My lord, uh, my client has made a great mistake. We are more than sorry for the great trouble we have caused. This man is obviously Sir Mark Lodden. Mark. Oh, my darling, I'm so ashamed. Can you ever forgive me? You didn't know. I hardly knew myself at times. Mark, you're so tired. Will you come home with me, Mark? Will you? Enid. Sir Mark? Yes, my lord? Sir Mark, before you leave, may I hope that something more than a name has been recovered by this trial? But, my lord? I cannot believe that the merciful providence which allowed Sir Mark and Lady Lawton to come together after all the dangers of the war will not again avail to bring them through this final tribulation. My lord, you may rest assured on that point. My wife and I are going home. stars take a minute's rest, we'll give you a glimpse of the future in the Lux Radio Theater. When you're listening next Monday night, this is what you'll hear in the middle of the second act. What are you going to do, Stacy? Going back to that jail. I'm going to give myself up. Are you crazy? What for? Because there's a guy in there doing 20 years, a guy I like. And I'm going to see that he gets out. Listen to me. They'll throw you in for life, Stacy. They'll shove you down in solitary till you rot. I'm warning you. Ah, don't be a sap. I broke out of that pen once and I can do it again. <laughs> they haven't built the jug yet that can hold me. We'll tell you the name of the play and the stars we're going to have a little bit later. March 15th is famous for many things, including the income tax. And don't forget that 12 o'clock tonight is the deadline. But here in the Lux Radio Theater, we'll remember the Ides of March as the day when Ronald Coleman, Edna Best, and Otto Kruger 
gave one of the most thrilling performances in our history. Oh, thank you, C.B. I've been giving testimony most of the evening, but I have a little more to submit with your permission. Well, then I'd better turn you over to our learned counsel, Otto Kruger. Well, whom does your testimony concern? A man who was too tall to get in the army. Well, that sounds like a very tall story, Ronnie. No, Edna, it's quite authentic. I don't know the man's name, but he was far above the height limit, which fits standard army equipment. He tried all branches of the service and was turned down by each one. Yet he became one of the heroes of Guadalcanal. Uh, what did he do? Start an army of his own? No, not exactly. But it must have confused the Japanese badly to hear his cheerful voice every day as it cut through the machine gun fire. A voice yelling candy, cigarettes, chewing gum that might have been more in place at the baseball park on Saturday afternoon. As long as the battle raged, he was there with his pack on his back. He was too tall for the army, but not too tall to follow the army to the front line in the uniform of the American Red Cross. This being the month that the Red Cross is raising its war fund, I think the good judgment of our listeners will carry on from there. And they'll know other good reasons to give to the Red Cross, Mr. DeMille. Things we see every day, like the making of surgical dressings and, and the training of nurses' aides. And don't forget the blood donor service. And now I think uh, we'd better cross-examine you, C.B. What about next week's play, huh? Just a minute, Otto. It's the women's turn on the witness stand. And I don't think that you can find a woman who doesn't agree with me that Lux Soap is really a wonderful complexion care. I've used it for years. Lux Soap always wins the case, Edna. Now about next week. The scene you heard a moment ago was from the Warner Brothers hit, Each Dawn I Die. And our stars will be George Raft, French O'Tone, and Lynn Barrett. I think your audience will be all on hand next week, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. That applause is your verdict. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Raft, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry in Each Dawn I Die. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, this month the Campfire Girls celebrate their 31st birthday. This army of 321,000 girls serving on the home front can expand its victory program even more if leaders can be obtained. Any woman wishing to volunteer may get in touch with the Campfire office in her community or with Campfire Girls Incorporated, 88 Lexington Avenue, New York. Campfire Girls Incorporated, 88 Lexington Avenue, New York. Otto Kruger will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Night Plane from Chungking. Heard in tonight's play were Frederick Warlock as Sir Wilfred, Alec Harford as Buckingham, George Sorrell as Fordon, Eric Snowden as Judge, and Norman Field, Claire Verdera, Thomas Mills, and Fred Mackay. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next month night to hear George Raff, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry in Each Dawn I Die. rationing and shortages worry me. I don't want my family to get low in vitamins, tired and nervous. But vitamin-rich foods take so many points, I just don't know what to do. Well, here's a tip, lady. Get unrationed and low-point foods and take extra vitamins. Get Vims at your druggist. Vims have all the essential vitamins and all the minerals commonly lacking. Yet Vims require no points. Remember, VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. Get them all in Vims. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.